Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. David vs. Goliath is one of humanity's favorite stories. There's something amazing about a tiny weak hero winning against a unstoppable powerful foe. Kind of like when Russell over here slammed his F-16 into that alien city ship. This idea of the underdog is completely ingrained into the human experience. And that's because humans are a relatively weak species, at least physically speaking. We can't run that fast or jump that high, our reflexes are slow, and our muscles are relatively weak and lower density. And so humans on an evolutionary scale are very much David in the David versus Goliath uh, scenario. We overcome the impossible with our mind. We build slings out of animal leather to strengthen our throws. And one day when humanity reaches the stars, we'll continue building metaphoric slings and use them to kill metaphoric alien goliaths that we encounter. And so in order to celebrate that amazing aspect of humanity, today we're gonna to be taking a look at some of the most lopsided space battles in science fiction. While well, everyone remembers the climactic citadel battle between the citizens of the Milky Way and the AI Reaper fleet, that battle, depending on how competent your version of Commander Shepard was, didn't need to be all that lopsided. The Reapers had perhaps 150 vessels on their side, and the Milky Way forces numbered in the tens of thousands. The Corian migrant fleet alone had over 50,000 ships that probably weren't well armed but could be used as cannon fodder. Would it be a desperate battle no matter what? Yes, I think so, but you did have three entire Bioware games to prepare for. It. Now, in Mass Effect 2, you start the game off in the original Normandy just months after the first Battle of the Citadel when that wacko Saren got possessed by machines and tried to kill everyone. The Normandy is hunting rogue Geth ships remaining from that former incursion when they encounter a massive mysterious ship which immediately opens fire on them with a beam weapon that destroys the Normandy's hull. Commander Shepard tries his best to hold things together, but ultimately runs out of oxygen while slowly re-entering the atmosphere of a planet sans starship. Luckily, a private organization with pro-human sentiment manages to resurrect Commander Shepard. They even give him a new ship, the Normandy SR-2. It's bigger, faster, and stronger than the original. Shepard is tasked with finding that mysterious ship that destroyed his Normandy. You see, it belongs to the Collectors. These are minions of the Reapers, and they've been kidnapping humans out of the outer colonies and experimenting with them. The Normandy ends up tracking the Collectors down through the Omega-4 Relay, a mysterious jump point that has become legendary because no traveler ever seems to make it back from it. When Commander Shepard arrives in the system, the crew finds themselves in the midst of a ship graveyard of all of the Collector's previous victims. Immediately, several drone ships begin attacking the Normandy. Luckily, Commander Shepard upgraded the Blade of Armored Plating on the Normandy so no potential core and love interests die in the engineering room. Or maybe you were too cheap to do that. After avoiding and destroying the small Collector drone ships, the giant Collector cruiser that kills Shepard the first time around appears again. The Sun Normandy is able to avoid its massive beam weapon and deliver its own payload. Hopefully your Shepard will have upgraded the Normandy with the Thanex Cannon. This was a Turian developed miniaturized and reverse engineered Reaper weapon that fired superheated molten metal contained in an electromagnetic field at ridiculous speeds. Using the Normandy's maneuverability and speed to his advantage, Helmsman Joker is able to avoid most of the incoming fire and get in close to the collector ship and use the Thanex Cannon to rip it in half. The Narada was just a civilian industrial ship. It had been built for deep space mining. And although it was quite massive and had large aggressive drilling apparatuses all over it, it wasn't exactly designed for war. Well, at least in 2387 it wasn't. The captain of the ship, Nero, was a miner who lost his entire family in 2387 when the Romulan home system sun supernova Nero blamed Ambassador Spock and his Federation for the tragedy. At the time, the Vulcan created a black hole out of red matter in order to absorb the supernova and prevent it from destroying other systems. The strategy did work, but it did not prevent the destruction of Romulus. Nero's ship, the Narada, had entered that black hole and was transported to the year 2233, where his mining ship all of a sudden became the most powerful ship in the entire galaxy. At one point, the Narada would engage 47 Klingon warbirds and destroy every one of them. But the most lopsided battle was when the Narada encountered the USS Kelvin on the edge of Klingon space. The USS Kelvin was a Starfleet survey vessel and only a fraction the size of the massive Narada. Actually, it was just a fraction of one of the Romulan 
Venezuelan mining ships many drills. Immediately, the Narada opens fire with what seems like mining munitions. These projectiles scatter shrapnel all across the whole of the USS Kelvin, creating breaches on several decks. The Romulans then call for a ceasefire and request that the Starfleet captain come on board for negotiations. Nero, however, has no interest in peace. He just wants to know the location of Ambassador Spock and his ship. When Nero realizes that the Starfleet captain is useless, he ends his life and continues his attack on the USS Kelvin. First Officer George Kirk takes command of the USS Kelvin and immediately gives the order to abandon ship. But in order to buy more time for his crew, and more specifically his wife and unborn son James, George Kirk would remain on the bridge of the ship alone and pilot it directly into the maw of the Narada, buying just enough time for most of the crew to escape onto shuttles and warn Starfleet about these time-traveling Romulan assholes. Because of George Kirk's brave actions during this battle, the Mjolnir Hammer would select him as its rifle bearer. The Battle of Yavin is probably the most famous space battle in science fiction, and with the release of Rogue One a few years ago, we even get to witness the series of tragic and heroic events that leads to this epic showdown. The DS-1 battle station goes up against a small ragtag group of rebels. The Death Star represents the pinnacle in Imperial engineering, design, science, and arrogance, along with a good percentage of the GDP of the entire galaxy. This massive 160-kilometer diameter spherical battle station was the size of a small moon, and it had a kyber crystal-powered super laser that could destroy entire planets in one shot. And during the Battle of Yavin, the only thing preventing the destruction of the rubble base on Yavin 4 was the gas giant of Yavin. You see, the Death Star had entered the local system with the gas giant in between it and the rubble base, and now it was slowly moving around the gas giant into firing position. The rebel lines had only two underpowered squadrons of starfighters and at best a half an hour to destroy this indestructible battle station. You had Red Squadron and its 22 X-Wings and Gold Squadron with its eight Y-Wings. Now the rebels weren't completely without hope. Intelligence had uncovered a small hidden weakness in the Death Star design. A small exhaust vent in the ship led straight to the center reactor. If someone could launch, say, a proton torpedo down that chute, it could set off a massive explosion that destroys the entire station. Now, the Y-Wing bombers were supposed to be the ones that delivered this killing blow, but they're destroyed before they can even get close to the target. And so Red Squadron, which had up until this point been harassing and strafing the surface of the Death Star, was now tasked with this impossible mission. With only a few X-Wings still active, Luke Skywalker enters the trench and begins his own run towards the vent. Darth Vader and two TIE fighters immediately fall onto his tail and begin to fire at him. But before Luke Skywalker's ship is taken out, Han Solo comes out of nowhere with the Millennium Falcon and cuts right through his pursuers. This buys Luke just enough time to make the perfect proton torpedo shot right down the chute, destroying the Death Star. The international fleet that humanity sent against the Formic homeworld was probably one of the biggest undertakings in human history. First, the trip to the enemy's planetary system was extremely far, and so essentially everything had to be pre-planned almost a century ahead of time. Unfortunately for humanity, the furthest Formic world was actually also their homeworld, where all of the queens would be located. And so when Commander Ender Wiggins is finally given control remotely of the fleet that is supposed to take out the Formic homeworld, it also is humanity's smallest, oldest, and least well-equipped fleet. In the beginning of the battle, Ender finds the homeworld of the Formix surrounded by a massive amount of bugger ships who lie in waiting in tight formation. His fleet is easily outnumbered hundreds to one. Ender decides to use the enemy's numbers against themselves and fires the molecular disruption device which creates a massive train reaction in the Formic formation. Thousands of Formic ships are destroyed instantaneously, and humanity thinks it has an early victory. But suddenly, energy readings appear all across the surface of the planet. For each Formic ship that was destroyed, another 100 emerges. Things seem hopeless now for humanity. But then Ender Wiggins comes up with a crazy strategy. He completely abandons his carriers and his ships of the line. Instead, he gets all of his fighters to surround the human ship with a molecular disruption device. He wants to get this super weapon as close to the planet's surface as possible so that he could fire the super weapon and hopefully set off a chain reaction that destroys the entire planet. The international fleet's fighters create a gigantic human shield and cut right through the Formic formation, taking terrible losses along the way. But ultimately, they clear enough of a path for the super weapon to fire upon the planet. The resulting explosion kills every Formic queen left in the galaxy, destroying the entire species.
Hera Agathon was a miracle, and that's because her parents were a human and Cylon mix. Perhaps one day she could bring peace between the organic humans and the synthetic Cylon. But the synthetic Cylon loyalists had a completely different vision for Hera. Although they saw her as a miracle, they also wanted to dissect her body and figure out the secret of her creation. The Cylons believed that Agatha was the key to saving their entire race, and so they bring her back to the colony where they can study her. The Battlestar Galactica was supposed to be undergoing repairs when it decided to retrieve Hera Agathon from the colony. And from the beginning, the Battlestar was completely outgunned. You see, the colony was a massive biomechanical structure armed to the teeth with weapons and placements and had a large complement of Raider fighter craft on board as well. To make matters worse, the colony was actually located in the debris field of a singularity. And so, the Battlestar Galactica had to jump directly alongside the colony and take on the gigantic structure at point-blank range. The Battlestar Galactica is the pride of the 12 colonies, or at least, I guess, what's left of it. But not even this ship could withstand such a punishing ordeal. Luckily, Samuel Anders, a pro-human Cylon, is able to shut down the weapons on the colony, buying the Battlestar Galactic some time. Once the colony realizes that their weapons have ceased working, they launch a huge contingent of Raider fighters towards the Battlestar. Meanwhile, the Battlestar Galactica launches their own Viper fighters in a defensive screen. It's at this point when the Battlestar Galactica plows directly into the colony, punching a gigantic hole in the station's side. This allows a strike team to enter the colony and retrieve Hera Agathon. At the end of the battle, the colony is struck by a stray warhead and falls into the gravity well of the Singularity. The Battlestar Galactica, however, manages to limp away, barely. So there you have it, guys, uh, five, well, actually four different situations in which humanity prevailed against overwhelming odds because they were able to use their minds and figure out a solution to impossible problems. So remember that guys, humanity is nothing without our brains. Use it, this is your ultimate weapon. Also guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.